Rahu Bot, everybody, all the brothers and sisters out there. Hope everybody's having a good day. Um, just had a notion to make a video uh, based off a case law of Rankin versus Howard. Uh, this is a case that was decided in 1980. Um, I don't, I'm going to be honest, I don't, uh, or I haven't read this case law in its entirety uh, but this was an interesting case uh, we're going to look at section B here in a minute because the judges actually applied a principle um, and a test to see whether uh, judges are immune to a suit or not and if you've been listening to my past videos you know I'm all about the jurisdiction of the courts um, there's a book called The Treatise of Jurisdiction by John Cleland Wells, which if you want to battle jurisdiction, you got to know how the courts get it and when they act without it and when they don't. Um, I'm deep in that book, man. I'm, I'm, I'm a master in that book. So there's three requirements that, it, you know, that a, a court must have to have the right to, to adjudicate a case. You know, one is subject matter jurisdiction, you know, and they got to have two out of the three. So it's subject matter jurisdiction. Now, any court could have subject matter jurisdiction because if the plaintiff brings the suit against a defendant, then the plaintiff automatically consents to the to the jurisdiction of the court or the court can't even hear the case. So that's kind of done automatically. It's implied that you're consenting to the court so they can rule in your favor if you're the plaintiff of course you want to win and that's the only reason why you're creating the lawsuit for litigation and then uh two is in rem jurisdiction which means property you know belonging in that common law jurisdiction and then three is in personam jurisdiction so without two of the three the case cannot proceed and i've I can't remember what video that was that I did probably like five or six months ago, but you know, I uh, reiterated those points for you guys. So this is Rankin versus Howard. We're going to go down to subsection B. Um, and this is called the clear absence of personal jurisdiction. So I'm going to read this in its entirety. So, um, so here we go. All right. Although the Supreme Court acknowledged in Stump versus Sparkman that Judge Stump may have committed grave procedural errors, 435 U.S. at 359, 98 Supreme Court Reporter at page 1106, it did not explicitly consider whether he acted in the clear absence of personal jurisdiction or whether such action would be protected by judicial immunity. The question appears to be one of first impression. All right, so whatever, this is, uh, I think, in the Ninth Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. So, of course, the appellant, which is probably uh, Rankin, brought this case to the appellant because he probably lost on the federal district court level and said that the judge on the district court level acted without the necessary uh, jurisdiction to decide on the case. So that's why I believe, I don't know for a fact, but I'm, I'm inferring that it that appears to be the first impression because he brought it up. The judge can't judge on something you don't bring to the table. They're not, they're not going to create your rights for you. Either you know them or you don't know them. So, okay, let's keep going. The district court here assumed that a court arguably having subject matter jurisdiction does not act in the clear absence of all jurisdiction. When the Supreme Court first formulated the clear absence standard, however, it stated that the principle of immunity applied when there was jurisdiction of both subject and person, as I mentioned at the top of this video. Bradley versus Fisher, 80 U.S. 13 Wall, 335, 352, 1872, 20 limited edition 646. 
An absence of personal jurisdiction may set to destroy all jurisdiction because the requirements of the subject matter and personal jurisdiction are conjunctual. That means it's got to be two out of the three. Both must be met before a court has authority to adjudicate the rights of parties to a dispute. If a court lacks jurisdiction over a party, then it lacks all jurisdiction to adjudicate that party's rights, whether or not the subject matter is properly before it. See, um, e.g., Colco versus Supreme Superior Court, 436 U.S. 84, 91, 98 Supreme Court Reporter, 1690, 1696, 56, limited edition, Reporter, 2nd edition, 132, 1938. It has been long held that rule, uh, it has been, long, okay, hold on, it has long been the rule that a valid judgment imposing a personal obligation or duty in favor of the plaintiff may be entered only by a court having jurisdiction over the person of the defendant. In Ray Wellman, uh, I'm going to skip all these case law citations, uh, ex parte guardianship proceeding would be a flagrant violation of due process, rendering any order null and void. Uh, I had a client go through this. Actually, he hasn't got back with me, but his wife did ex parte i mean she filed like petitions uh child support divorce and lied and said her life was in danger y'all when she was already proven to be mentally unstable and the judge still granted ex parte to the whole process hey you know who i'm talking about out there that's one of my clients get back with me about that um because the limits of personal jurisdiction constrain judicial authority Acts taken in the absence of personal jurisdiction do not fall within the scope of legitimate decision making that judicial immunity is designed to protect. See Gregory versus Thompson. We conclude that a judge who acts in the clear and complete absence of personal jurisdiction loses his judicial immunity. It is not sufficient that the court, in fact, lack jurisdiction because jurisdictional issues are often difficult to resolve. Judges are entitled to decide such issues without fear of reprisal should they exceed the precise limits of their authority. Stump versus Sparkman. Judi uh, judges of courts of general jurisdiction are not liable for judicial acts merely in excess of their jurisdiction, even when the acts are alleged to have been done maliciously or corruptly uh okay yeah we have to read bradley versus fisher about that when a judge knows that he lacks jurisdiction or acts in the face of clearly valid statutes or case law expressly depriving him of jurisdiction judicial immunity is lost in the same case see bradley versus fisher when the want of jurisdiction is known to the judge no excuse is permissible Turner versus Reyn is. Stump is consistent with the view that a clearly inordinate exercise of unconferred jurisdiction by a judge, one so crass as to establish that he embarked on it either knowingly or recklessly, subjects him to personal liability. Now, conferred. Conferred means you're transferring necessary powers for another person to act upon. So, you know me in that book, uh, The Treatise on the Jurisdiction of the Courts by John Cleland Wells. I suggest everybody get this book on Amazon. It says, if a court has a want of jurisdiction, uh, not this is not verbatim, but they have if they have a want of jurisdiction, if if it was impossible for them to get jurisdiction in the first place, jurisdiction cannot be conferred by consent. Even if you consented and there's no way they're supposed to have the jurisdiction, they can't get jurisdiction anyway. Okay? Uh, go back and look at my past videos about that. I've gone over that exclusively. Okay? All right. Let's go on. If, as alleged, Judge Zeller knew the jurisdictional allegations to be fraudulent, or if valid Kansas statutes expressly foreclosed personal jurisdiction over a proposed ward in ex parte, 
proceeding for temporary guardianship, then the judge acted in the clear and complete absence of personal jurisdiction. If his acts were part of a conspiracy, he is properly held responsible for the consequences. All right. So hopefully you guys got the gist of the clear absence principle and test that the courts will use if you bring up the argument that a child support judge, which you know a child support judge is not supposed to be there under Canon's Law 3 because they have a financial interest in the case. And there's also a Supreme Case Law um, in which uh, Justice Scalia gave the opinion of the court. So there's more than ample evidence to prove that. So another, you know, if you're, if you're one of my listeners, man, I suggest you look up Bradley versus Fisher because that's probably an interesting case here about jurisdiction from some of these judges. So again, I'm bringing you the facts, nothing but the facts. You know, this is, you know, I'm a Nuwabian nation of more, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a use Nuwabu and that's all logic and science. We don't, believe in spook tales and all that stuff if you can't prove it i don't want to hear it <laughs> all right well i hope everybody has a good day i got to get back to work uh, but hopefully this helps somebody you know in their struggle and if you need my help um you know where to go you know where to go it's called goldenmoreservices.com uh you're more than happy to check out the site i haven't wrote a blog but i do write from that book that i'm talking about and i give you know, I give my opinion about what I'm reading and you can also book an appointment here. All right. So we also have attorney reviews, which um, I haven't filled this in yet, but I'm going to get on this. This is about attorneys uh, with some of my clients. You know, they got attorneys and the attorneys uh, have uh, have double crossed them. Uh, and if you challenge an attorney to make them invoke uh your rights uh they'll ask to be removed from the case i know that because two or three of my clients have gone through the same thing they'll ask to be removed because you know they're all in it to make money and the judge is in on it too so anyway uh enjoy my video hopefully it helps you out um god bless have a good day and why do